Welcome back. Court TV is bringing you the trial of Ryan Duke. The trial took place while we were in the Johnny Depp defamation case, so of course we played that one live. But our cameras were there and we recorded it, and the verdict is shocking. So you want to watch it. Duke is accused of killing Tara Grinstead 16 years ago. The verdict in the case was so surprising. We're going back and showing the whole thing to you, and you can decipher it for yourself. On day four of this trial, the state played Duke's confession to the jury. The GBI's agent at first conducted an interview, which was audio only. Then when he starts getting into the actual confession, they said, oh boy, we better turn the old video camera on for this one. And that's what we're going to watch play out. Here's the digital audio recording of that initial part of the interview. Today's day is uh, Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2017. And 
And he said, how did you get there? That's what I have a hard time remembering because I've been drinking and I don't even remember getting in a car. I stole it. Oh, really? Pretty much. I took the keys out of his pants and left. Okay, so he's passed out. Do you remember, was this like after midnight? This is pretty late. It was pretty late. It was, like I said, I had passed out from drinking. Do you remember any animals in the house or outside of the house? Not sure. Okay. So you probably, if you took his truck, you probably drove over there. Yes, sir. Do you remember where you parked out around in there? Just on the same street? I don't even know. I mean, I... And why her? Of all the people, why her? I would ask my other self that same question. I mean, did you know it was whose house it was before you got there? No, sir. I don't think so. I mean, I mean I if y'all had a relationship or there was something else there, that's okay. She was she had relationships with lots of other people, including other students. That's not a secret. No, sir, I, I didn't. I never even had a conversation with her. Okay. You know. Sir, you 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 hit her and she fell and you think at that point she was probably gone. I don't know. I mean I, Because you had to go y'all both went back there and she was she, still not moving. No, sir, I went back by myself. Okay. I, I said she would check her pulse and there wasn't one. Okay. So you, did, did you immediately, you, you said you left and you had to come back. Yes. So I'm assuming the door was still probably not locked. Or did you have to break back in again or? No, sir. I mean, I, I don't remember having to, so I don't think I locked it. I mean, I'm not even sure if I shut the door. Okay. You know what I mean? So you leave and you go, you're probably thinking I probably need some help with this, but then maybe change your mind at first? I don't know what I was feared. Panic, and I know I went back, and I, I, I got her, and I, I took her to the... Did you take anything from the house? No, sir. You didn't take her purse and her keys? You put them in the dumpster out behind the... Uh, I may have. Uh, out behind the, the dry cleaner there in Fisher Road on your way out there? After all that is... I mean, you were going through her purse, so obviously that was the initial... You probably thought you left some... I might have just grabbed it. Obviously, I realized that I had it at some point. Did you ever go through a car or anything? No, sir. Okay. So you go through a purse and do whatever afterwards. You go and you pick up her body. Um, you put it, I'm assuming you're, this is still in Bo's truck. Yes, sir. And you put it in the back or did you put it in the front seat? It was in the back. It was I got a quilt and wrapped her up in there. Okay. So she didn't have any clothes on when you... Yes, sir. She had all the clothes on. I mean, this is afterwards, so... Yes, sir. I'm you know, you probably come down from whatever you were on. But if she did, I, I don't know how to... Somebody did. Did Bo help you take her clothes off? No, sir. I mean, I... Yeah. Okay, so you take her out to where? To cremate her? It was a field in Fitzgerald. Uh, off of... The places where Bo and... You know, I guess he threw a party or two out there from time to time. Yeah, I was, I was familiar with it, yes, sir. Okay. So, I'm assuming this is Saturday night now. This is late Saturday night, early Sunday morning when you lose the body. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so now we're rolling. And uh, you left her there because y'all didn't, you didn't burn her the same day you dropped her body out there, did you? Yes, sir. And your conscience got the better of me and you went and told those Sunday that you had done it, didn't you? Yes, sir. After you picked her up, did you ever go back again? Did you ever make any phone calls to the house or anything like that? No, sir. I mean, I... I mean, we know some phone calls got made to our house early Sunday. Well, that's when I called. I wanted to... I hadn't got her at that point. Okay. I, I called. I was hoping she was okay. And How did you call? What did you do? Uh, from a pay phone. Okay. I, I called back the number. Okay. I know there were some gloves at the house. Is that going to have your DNA on it? It should. That's okay. that mine. That's, I just, I just, was it just accidental leaving the glove? It was pure accident? Yes, sir. It was, this was in the bedroom, right? I don't know where it was at. I mean, I... You go and get Bo. And you two go right back out there and you told him what you had done again. Yes, and he probably still didn't believe you, but you kind of had to prove it to him, didn't you? Yes, sir. And... Out there, and her body's still where you.
Ryan Duke laying it out, uh, and at this point, the officers say, we got to turn the cameras on. We'll have that when we return. Stay with us. Be at thezebra.com now. Welcome back. Court TV is airing the fascinating case of the Beauty Queen murder trial. Uh, it's Ryan Duke is, sta is standing trial. The state just revealed to the jury that the, that turning point when Ryan Duke goes in there and just lays it all out. He confesses to the murder of Tara Grinstead. It took Duke just 90 seconds to admit that he killed Grinstead in that interview. And at this point, the investigators say, oh boy, oh, we got to turn these cameras on. Let's go back and pick it up where we left off. All right, so the fall, we know it was 2005. And yeah, so the fall of 2005 was kind of what's going to serve here. That sound about right, right after you got out of the military? Okay, so when you got out of the military, you moved in with who? Uh, my dad. Okay. And my brother. Peggy, my dad stayed with us for maybe a month or two. And then he got a job and moved. He got his own place. And it was me and my brother. Both stayed with us all in all. You say in one particular night, you don't remember exactly the day, exactly the day you said you were dealing with, you know, some drugs and some alcohol issues in your life. Um, I'm assuming you started that house because you had to get, you said you had to get those keys. Yes, sir. I woke up and I passed out the bathroom and like I said, I just, I wanted to get high. What kind of truck did he have? It was a Fox Ford F-150. Okay. And you just, did, were you just kind of like driving around the facility? No, sir. I was four or five different houses that you can tell if somebody's home or not. You know, it was, I, I, like I said, I don't know how I ended up there. Uh, but it was random. So you go to the front door, and 
Mr. Chairman, we'll start from there. I got an announcement on the 13th with a critical form to determine the law to this law. As I said, you can talk to it real easy with a card. I learned that when I locked myself out several times. So I went in the house on Saturday the first. Next thing I know, she said something and grabbed me on the shoulder, and I fear. And I said, I think I was in. And I said, I said, I said, I said, I went home and I came back and, uh, and I called. Let's go back over where you said you called him. Yes. I know you said it was. Yes. You said that he, this was, was his daylight when you came back? It was. He was the daylight. It's very early in the morning. So you, you said you went to, uh, what, you went to what kind of phone did you use? It was a pay phone. Do you remember which store it was? Uh, the TNG Manuals, I think. I can't remember what it was at the time. The one right next to Pax? Yes, sir. So yes. you went to the payphone there, you said? Yes. And you, how did you call the house? What did you do? I dialed 411. They gave the number, so I didn't know what to do. And they wouldn't an answer. And, uh, I went and I drove by. And you were hoping that she would answer the phone. Yes. And when she did, you knew something was on her. Yes, sir.
anyone else didn't get any drugs from anybody that night? Ryan Duke laying out his confession. His defense says this was a false confession. Still with us, clinical psychologist and PTSD expert, Dr. Norman Freed in New York, and trial attorney C.K. Hoffler in um, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, doctor, did, what did what, you hear there? And um, do you think it was a false confession or was he laying out the truth? It was an accurate confession in my clinical opinion. What we have here is uh, Officer Shodell did a brilliant, brilliant job of doing what we call consulting with the expert. He asked questions that had a yes or no possible answer and nothing was rebuked. At, at times, Shodell said things like, I'm assuming you did this and I believe you probably did this. And he said, no, sir, or yes, sir. He gave every chance to correct Shodell. Secondly, he's describing elements of PTSD whereby he's having hypervigilance to the recurrence of more danger and flashbacks. He said from the very start, I can't carry this anymore. I just want to get it out. And for these reasons, I believe what he's saying is 100% accurate. CK, your thoughts. What'd you hear? I thought the confession sounded pretty credible to me. I mean, certainly the officer, you know, as a lawyer, the officer was leading him as a witness. You know, he was saying he was he was re, he was retelling the story, but he was asking him to confirm confirm certain facts. And even though it seemed like he wanted to unburden himself, um, I felt it seemed like a pretty credible confession. So. Um, I, I really, you know, he, he seemed as though he just really wanted to tell this truth. And the officer was getting it out of him. He was being very gentle with him, confirming he certainly was leading him down a path. But he was leading him down a path based on answers he had given previously. And doctor, to your point earlier, this he said he, he couldn't live with it anymore. Is that, um, that makes sense to you that this was Yes, from, 
It was a tremendous burden. And from a clinical perspective, what he was saying was, I've been having flashbacks and flash forwards, and I can't do this anymore. And we even see repetition compulsion, the leaving of the gloves there. There are some unconscious things going on where he's actually saying, I'm, I needed to be caught. I can't live like this anymore. And that's why I believe the PTSD is revealing itself quite clearly here. Mm, even said, uh, I know I'm going to prison and uh, seemed to acknowledge that, all right, after this, you're going to okay. put me in the old clink. Um, fascinating. And what's even more fascinating is the outcome, what the jury saw in this confession. Dr. Norman Freed, thank you for your expertise. Really appreciate you helping us uh, decipher what we're watching here.